Okay. So let me start by um, apologizing to everybody for the mix up. Um, tonight, our speaker is Rabbi Allison Van, who's the spiritual leader of Suburban Temple and has been there since 2011. Um, Suburban Temple Kol Ami is a 70-year-old congregation, and it's known for its innovative and welcoming approach to membership and learning. Rabbi Van graduated from the University of Pittsburgh and was ordained by the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in 1999, and she served as a rabbi for Temple Bethel in Antonio, Texas, which is why she knows what Texas hot is. And um, uh, she has a lot of credits for uh, activities and boards in Cleveland, which I'll skip and just uh, get to the part where she is now the um, a part of a leadership team of the Religious Action Center, Ohio, which is an organized community bringing reformed Jews from across Ohio together in the pursuit of justice. In our state. And she is also a member of the Ethics Committee of the Central Conference of American Rabbis. And um, like uh, Rabbi Steve said last week, if we were doing this in chronological order, we would have started um, with reformed Judaism because it is older than conservative and reconstructionist, but we didn't. So um, Rabbi Van will fill us in and um, we can uh, turn it over to her. All right. <clears throat> well, thank you everybody. Um, doing this a little bit out of order took away some of my, you know, my usual spiel. So I, I had to recreate some of what I've been teaching for 20 something years. Um, because usually what I do is start off with asking people what they think came first, what movement came first. But um, you already know that it, you already know something. Um, so I'm really, really honored to, to be teaching you and to be here. And so thank you for the invitation. Um, it is a little bit strange to, kind of come in the middle when teaching the five streams. And so what I really ask you to tell me is that as I'm teaching, I um, if you know this already, don't don't suffer in silence. Let me know um, because <clears throat> I can pretty easily jump into a different topic or a different area. And if there's something that you're curious about, please, you know, do the little cute emoji hand raise or interrupt me or something like that. Um, I will be sharing my screen quite a lot. And so if you have a question and I don't notice it, just interrupt um, because that's gonna be the easiest way for me to know that you have a question. Um, because I would love for this to be as much of a conversation as Zoom can allow. And I don't know what you know. Um, it's part of the awkwardness of coming into a small classroom environment and you know what you all know, but I have no idea. So um, I don't want to. Uh, I don't. I don't want to patronize you. I, I. You know. I want to give you new information. So I'm going to start uh, with sharing my screen. Um, and let's see. I have to move. I'm going to move this over. I do have two screens on my desk. So if there's a point in which I'm looking this way, I'm not ignoring you. I'm. I've learned that um, two screens makes for a really much easier. Um, oh, but it wait, I've got to pop it over. Hang on. You guys are seeing, you guys are not seeing the slideshow, right? Yes, we are. Are you seeing it? Okay, great. You're seeing the slideshow? Yes. Great. Okay. So you don't need that part? All right, so you know that Reform Judaism is the older of the movements. <clears throat> I don't know how much you know of the why. Uh, Reform Judaism is um, one of the oldest movements because 
it um, by the 1800s, more and more Jews were beginning uh, the word rights I put in here because I didn't have much space rights is a, it's a little iffy of a word right beginning to acquire rights in European countries. Um, they more they were having more freedoms. Um, they were being able to go to school where they to secular school, they were being able to dress in the secular fashions, being able to pursue occupations um, they hadn't been able to do. In other words, they were leaving the shtetl life, which is an Eastern European um, topic, but and it was mostly Western European. Um, so the Judaism that they knew was not the Judaism that they could live because the Judaism they knew was a completely insular life and they didn't live an insular life anymore. So they really were stuck and it, it's very binary, but they were really stuck with not great choices to leave Judaism behind or to recreate. And so much like the ancient rabbis did, they thought that maybe recreating was the right choice. And so in Germany, they began to really think through what would this recreating look like? So they did, they began recreating. So I've put together a, a pretty brief timeline of milestones in reform Judaism. So we're gonna look at things in two different ways. One is timeline and then and then we're going to look at ideas. We're going to hit both in both, but first I want to touch on a bunch of, of historical moments. Um, and then with those historical moments, we're going to go a little deeper into some ideas. And then I have um, some a little text study for us to look at. So what that looked like was by 1810 in Sison, Germany, there was an actual reform congregation. What did that look like? It meant that men and women were sitting together. That's pretty radical. It, it meant that there were some prayers that were actually in German, um, which, were, which was also pretty radical, not just in Hebrew, um, that there was some music that uh, looked more like uh, the music of the times. So this is, this is extremely different than what had happened. At the same time, we also know what's happening is that people are, are traveling, they're coming to new worlds. And so what happened by 1824, this is a, a fact that a lot of people don't know, it's a really fun fact. Where were the first reformed Jews? The first reformed Jews were not in New York. They were not in Ellis Island. They were in Charleston, South Carolina, um, which is really, really fun. So um, reform came, reform Judaism came to the United States from Germany and really rooted itself in, in Charleston, South Carolina. So if you've been to Charleston, South Carolina, and you've been to Kahal Kadosh Beth Elohim, um, KKBE, um, in Charleston, South Carolina, that is the oldest continuing reform congregation in the United States. Um, and my friend Stephanie Alexander is the rabbi. It is, it is a very interesting congregation. Um, and that's the Reformed Society of Israelites. And that was created in 1824. And I wanna, yeah, I'll get there in a minute. So 1824 is when the movement of Reform Judaism, that this organized piece, and obviously we're not talking about Jews coming to America. We know Jews were in America for much, much, much longer. We know that Jews were very much a part of the creation of the United States, they were involved in the in the war, all of those things. But as an organization coming to the United States, 1824, establishing this congregation. Fast forward, remember, I'm only doing some highlights. Um, the Union of American Hebrew Congregations, which was founded to be a union for all American synagogues, not just for reform synagogues, but the dream was a big dream the big dream was to unify all American synagogues. So that's why it was a union of American Hebrew congregations, not reform congregations, not conservative congregations, American Hebrew congregations. The dream was very real to bring all American Jews together. And that was in 1873. 
And the word Hebrew was very important because at that point it was pejorative to call someone a Jew and it was polite to call someone a Hebrew, right? We flipped now, right? We don't call anyone a Hebrew and it's fine to call someone a Jew, right? Depending on how you say it. So 1873, the UAHC was formed. In 1875, within two years of the UAHC, Hebrew Union College was formed. And I want you to take note of where we are. First, we're in South Carolina, and now we're in Cincinnati, Ohio, right? Where do we think of Judaism rooting itself? We think of Judaism as coastal. Judaism at this point is not coastal. Judaism is in the South and in the Midwest. So Cincinnati, Ohio is where the first permanent Jewish institution of higher learning is founded. Hebrew Union College is in Cincinnati, Ohio. It is for now still there to this day. Um, and so this is where it's higher learning and it's the first place that the uh, first American rabbis will be ordained. 10 years after Hebrew Union College is founded, Pittsburgh platform. What's a platform? A platform is not just something we stand on. It is a place where we can, these, this is what we believe. This is who we are and what we believe. So I wanna stop the share for just a moment because this is a great story. So the Pittsburgh platform came because in 1883, which is the first year that um, reform rabbis were ordained by um, Hebrew Union College, they served a banquet and they served an ordination banquet. And what was served at this ordination banquet? Does anyone know the answer to this? Anyone wanna unmute and tell me? Nancy, you're already unmuted, go for it. Shrimp. Shrimp and lobster, <laughs> lots and lots and lots of treif. This is known in 1883, the ordination banquet is called the Trefa banquet. Um, it was on purpose and it caused, I'm sure you can guess, a ruckus, right? This did not go down well. This was really on purpose. So in 1885, it became clear that there needed to be a statement. Who are we and what are we? What are these rabbis? What do they stand for? And so in 1885, they created what's called the Pittsburgh Platform. And they shared their tenants and their tenants were that we need to radically create a modern reform Judaism for the United States. Well, they went a little too far and they kind of threw out the baby with the bathwater and many were like, yeah, we're out. This is too much. The Trefa banquet was enough and now we are done. And what happened was, what happens when people go too far? Oh, it's, uh, let's see, hold on, share. Did I get it? Can you see it? Or is it reversed? You're good? Okay. So what happens when things go too far? Um, when things go too far, um, this is where the Jewish Theological Seminary came in. JTS was born and thus was born the conservative movement. So really, you know, we know that the conservative movement was a reactionary response, but the conservative movement was ultimately a reactionary response to the first ordination by Hebrew Union College and the Pittsburgh platform, 1883 and 1885. And you, you can really see in these documents, um, people really trying to figure out what's going on. And often when there's a pendulum swinging, it goes too far and then it goes too far, right? So we're trying we're, to figure we're out. Just, we're what? just seeing your cover slide. Oh, I've got to swap it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, I just got to figure out how to do it with dual screen. Let me stop the share. I'm going to turn my second screen off. Let's do this. It's okay. Thank you, Louise. Hang on. Good. Everybody's good. You have a black box. You're in the um, milestones, the, the same slide with that shows the dates of the yes. uh, events. Yes, but I just need to 
Hang on. Okay. Everybody can see everything now? Okay. So what we're seeing now is in the United States, a real push and pull through these events of what is an American Judaism? Who are we and what do we want to be? And so the, this timeline is just a boring timeline, but if you kind of dig below the surface, you're really seeing pretty incredible stuff happening. Um, so from the Pittsburgh platform, all these rabbis got together, they adopted this platform and they said, we can't just be rabbis, we have to come together and be something. So in 1889, the Central Conference of American Rabbis was born, which is the professional arm of the rabbinate. It's what I belong to, like my rabbinic union, okay? Any questions so far? Whoops. Any questions so far? Okay. Rabbi, Rabbi Van, yeah. I, I, I'm sorry, I just was curious. Do, do you happen to know at the time of the founding of, of HUC how many congregations there were that didn't identify as reform that were actively, you know, in existence in the U.S.? I don't know the answer, like in 1875. Yeah. That is an awesome question. How many, so how many congregations there, first of all, how many congregations there were in America? How many congregations would be sending students to this rabbinic school? Um, that is a great question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I would say that by 1875, there was um, except for like maybe the deep, you know, upper Northern Plains, at least one to three congregations in every state, huh. like maybe not Utah or North Dakota. <laughs> 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 um, but most states had congregations by 1875. Do you, do you have a sense of how many of those congregations had rabbis serving them at that point? No. <laughs> and at that point, if they had rabbis, they were still coming from Europe. Yeah. Right? Because this is 1875 is the first seminary, the first higher institution. Mm -hmm. So all the rabbis were either, you know, self-ordaining or coming, you know, coming from Europe. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, these institutions, you know, these mile markers seem kind of boring, like, oh, she's just showing us the timeline, but it's really the beginning of who are we as an American Judaism and what's important to us. What's important was uh, an institution of higher education was really it's one of the first things we really did as a combined community um and it 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 was very clear that it wasn't going to work for all of us as americans as american jews right because we we have a lot of differences and we went our separate ways pretty quickly <laughs> especially you know if you're going to serve shrimp it's not a good idea <laughs> Especially not so, in an ordination. I Especially not in an ordination. <laughs> yeah. What happy did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, what does the Central Conference of American Rabbis do for you? You said you belong to it. It's your yeah. professional arm. What does that mean to be a professional arm? So it's like, you know, a, a Central Conference of American Rabbis is my like rabbinic union. So when I do placement, I go through the Central Conference of American Rabbis. When I um, when I want to do professional, continuing professional education, I work with the Central Conference of American Rabbis. When I go to a rabbinic conference, the conference is put on by the Central Conference of American Rabbis. When we want to make a statement um, about something awful, God forbid, happening in Israel, the Central Conference will make the statement on behalf of reform rabbis. Um, uh, right now, we're we're trying to advocate and agitate for. Um, uh, you know, it's not going to happen for Roe v. Wade not to get overturned. The Central Conference will make, um, we call it the conference, but that only means something to us, right? The conference will make a statement 
Um, and then we continue, like the Pittsburgh platform, we continue to come together every certain number of years to try to study and release um, platforms or statements on where, where we think we are as a reform movement. That's a great question. Thank you. We're always asking that question because my dues are very high. <laughs> yeah. What are you doing for me? <laughs> right. Right. And where, where, where is their main office located? The Central Conference of American Rabbis main office is located in New York, um, mm -hmm. in New York City. However, the pandemic also proved that um, not every uh, employee of the Central Conference of American Rabbis has to be in New York. So they do have quite a few remote employees. Other questions? Let me jump back in. So the CCR was founded in 1889. Let's keep going or not. Come on. Okay. So then our first prayer book was written in 1895, known as the Union Prayer Book. I'm sure many of you have seen it at some point or another. Um, there was Union Prayer Book 1, 2, and 3. Um, and they were in print until the 1950s. Little black prayer books. Um, the first union prayer book, by the way, I have a number of copies of them. I don't think I brought any with me, um, had zero English and called the rabbi minister. Um, the reform movement was, the early reform movement was very interesting. So, which leads rabbi, me to, yeah. Rabbi, rabbi, I think you said the first had zero English. Zero Hebrew. <laughs> Did I say English? Yes. That was so Freudian. Any, any therapists here? Maybe I need to work with yes. them. <laughs> so Freudian. Um, no, zero English. Um, I think even the Shema, zero Hebrew. I think even the Shema was in English and the rabbi was called minister. Um, and But what was fascinating is that for the reform movement, there were some people who the conservative, the early conservative movement, Jewish theological seminary was still too much. And so the Jewish Institute of Religion, which is the next milestone, was founded in 1922 as an alternate seminary in New York City because Hebrew Union College and the first prayer book were, were too far. It was too much. It was too much letting go of traditions. So Jewish Institute of Religion was founded by Stephen S. Wise as, a, as different from Isaac M. Wise in Cincinnati in 1922. Um, in 1937, the CCAR, Central Conference of American Rabbis, had a, comp had a conference in Columbus, Ohio, and they released the Columbus Platform. Um, the last platform had not been released since 18, um, 90, 1875, and the platform was um, oh, the platform. Uh, what? Sorry, the I've never heard the doorbell before in Zoom, and I'm so loving it. Um, it the plat these platforms were designed to share the tenets of American Reform Judaism. Um, early Reform Judaism, very early, was anti-Zionist. Um, and there's a slight shift um, to can we be more Zionist or can we not be more Zionist? There's a struggle here. 1937, they're a little bit more pro-Zionist, um, not quite going all the way there. <clears throat> I forgot something. I noticed it right before we... We, I jumped on, so I put a little arrow there. In 1939, um, NIFTI, the North American Federation of Temple Youth, which is our uh, youth group, was launched. So many people don't realize that our youth group is, um, our reform movement youth group is quite old. It's been around for a long time. Um, in 1950, um, Hebrew Union College and Jewish Institute of Religion um, really had become very similar in their practices. Um, Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati had moved, you know, the pendulum had swung back slightly more to the center and Jewish Institute of Religion hadn't moved that much, but HUC had moved enough. Um, so they merged. They kept both campuses, Cincinnati and New York, and students could be on either campus. And so it became HUC, JIR, Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion. 
the Union for American Hebrew Congregations moved from Cincinnati to New York. So now you start to see the move from the center of the country to the coasts of the country, right? So whereas before there was a significant focus, the Columbus platform, the Pittsburgh platform, South Carolina, Cincinnati, you know, now we're seeing things in New York, right? The Jewish Institute of Religion, the um, UAHC is in New York, all of these things. So we start to see a real focus on New York um, I didn't put a lot of milestones in there, but LA becomes a focus as well. There were too many milestones, you would have fallen asleep. So 1952, something very important happens, which doesn't seem so important, but it becomes really apparent about 20 years later how important it is. In 1952, the Union for American Hebrew Congress, oh wait, hold on. I forgot to say, what is the Union for American Hebrew Congregations? It is the um, con congregational sort of union for the reform movement. So just as the Central Conference of American Rabbis is sort of our governing, it's sort of our group. So the UAHC is, brings together all of the congregations for the reform movement. Um, at that point, there were enough congregations that they needed someone to help guide them and bring them together and be resources for them. One of the things that came out of that in 1952 was this idea of a summer camp. So in 1952 in Wisconsin, Oconomowoc, Wisconsin, don't ask me to spell it, um, was the founding of Olensang Ruby Union Institute in Oconomowoc, Wisconsin, the first summer camp. Um, it was a wild success. And one after another, more and more summer camps became part of what the reform movement um, started to support. Um, right now, the reform movement has 18 summer camps throughout the United States. 15 are sort of regular summer camps, um, what we call regional summer camps, um, everywhere, anywhere from uh, Canada, Camp George is in Canada, to uh, near outside Boston, to Los Angeles, outside in California, to Florida, and in Georgia, Florida, and Texas, uh, Goldman Union Camp Institute, where I go and my son goes, is in uh, Indianapolis, and now we have um, a sports camp, an arts camp, and a, and a sci-tech camp. Um, the camps serve up to 10,000 campers a year, um, you know, without COVID. COVID changes everything. So um, camp totally changed the, the movement because we started learning um, together in deep community and what that community could be. And um, we all know what camp can be. So, um, in 1961, the Religious Action Center was founded. The Religious Action Center is the political um, act, the advocacy arm of the reform movement. Um, the physical location of the Religious Action Center is in DuPont Circle um, in Washington, DC. And the physical location is where a significant portion of the civil rights legislation was, was written because no one else would allow um, the writers of the legislation to sit together, black and white, um, to, uh, to write this legislation. So the goals of the civil rights legislate, this, the goals of the religious um, action center are to uh, further the values and tenets of the reform movement throughout our uh, political arms without crossing the boundaries of um, church state. Um, the Religious Action Center has been wildly successful. Um, many of the directors of the Religious Action Center have met with presidents, have marched with, marched with Martin Luther King, et cetera. That's 1961. In 1972, the first woman uh, was ordained uh, in Cincinnati, Sally Presand. This year, we celebrate 50 years of women being ordained. Um, if you'd like to buy a very wonderful kids book, you can buy the book from Sandy Eisenberg Sasso, Sally Open Doors, to celebrate the 50th ordination of women 
um, in the United States. Um, Sandy Eisenberg Sasso, as you know, is a Reconstructionist rabbi, and she wrote this in honor of Sally. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lovely, lovely book. Um, so, um, in 1976, um, there was a platform that was adopted for the 100th year of the UHC and HUC JIR, which is very reflective. Um, what does it mean for, uh, for us as Jews to survive post-Holocaust? And what does it mean um, uh, for, the, for the state of Israel? So it's a very reflective, thoughtful piece about who we are and who we can be moving forward in the United States which led to um, Alexander Schindler was the president of, Un of the Union of American Hebrew Congregations. And um, he felt very strongly, and then it became passed that in 1983, we, um, we as a movement, both the CCAR and the UAHC began uh, accepting patrilineal descent, not just matrilineal descent. This was a massive, this was seismic. Um, I cannot, I mean, Louise is like, yes, right? <laughs> this was, I cannot underestimate, you know, at all um, to be a movement that um, went against what traditional Judaism had taught and what many traditional Jews still teach um, was uh, to split, really to create a split particularly with the conservative and orthodox movements um, and um, to really name that interfaith marriage in 1983, this was a big deal to name that interfaith marriage was here to stay and that we were not going to stop interfaith marriage. We were going to um, recognize its reality. Uh, so that was, that was a massive, massive choice, um, that, um, made some congregations leave the reform movement and had some individuals feel heard and seen for the first time in their lives. So, and it continues to have repercussions to this day, um, there are weddings that I do that we have conversations. Do they need to convert? Um, what if their children want to move to Israel? What if they want to marry an Orthodox Jew? Um, they're huge, huge conversations. And yet, had we not accepted patrilineal descent, they would not have found a Judaism that they love. So um, it's, it's massive and important um, conversation and decision on behalf of the progressive movement in Judaism. Um, the Miami platform um, was really all about reaffirming our connection to um, Zionism and to Israel. And then in 1999, this was the year I was ordained. Um, uh, in 1999, we did our centenary uh, statement of principles. So rather than a platform, um, there was this statement of principles, who are we and what do we believe in? Um, this was the first time uh, that reform rabbis had come together to say, this is what we believe in and not, you know, this is what we're about. And those are very different things. And so this, um, this was a big deal. It was in, I remember it was in CNN. It was, you know, there were a lot of interviews um, and the platform was the first, I shouldn't say platform, it was the first um, academic piece voted on by rabbis about what we're about that used Hebrew in the piece. Uh, we used the word mitzvot in Hebrew. We used, so this was really affirming that the reform movement had come uh, radically in a different place from where we started in the 1860s and 1880s. Uh, it's a beautiful piece. Um, and it really set up where we wanted to go from 1999 to today. I'm going to finish this up and then we're going to um, look at some of the beliefs. Um, so the last page of this, in 2003, the UHC recognized that that language was no longer appropriate language and we became the URJ, the Union for Reform Judaism. Uh, 2007, we, um, in 1975, we had left the, um, 
uh, the prayer book, the first prayer book behind and had adopted um, uh, Gates of Prayer, which I affectionately call Gates of Blue because it has a uh, blue cover. And in 2007, we moved to Mishkan Tefila. It's only the third prayer book because there were versions of, of um, the first prayer book. I'm just totally blanking. Um, there were versions of um, Union Prayer Book um, but it never was completely rewritten. So n since 1975, it was our first original prayer book. Um, 2007, Mishkana Nefesh was our, our first original Mahzor. What do I mean by that? We had um, a Mahzor that we used, um, Gates of Repentance, but that Mahzor was completely based on the Mahzor used in England by the Reform Movement. So this was our first original Mahzor, um, Mishkan HaNefesh. It is a magnificent, magnificent Mahzor. Um, and as you can tell, took eight years to write. Um, in 2018, um, the Religious Action Center chained, um, added a direction. And what we do now is, and um, Alan, thank you for mentioning this. So in addition to national advocacy, we also have statewide advocacy. So all congregations in Ohio are invited to join, all reform congregations in Ohio are invited to join our voices together to create statewide change. Recognizing that in the past, each congregation, uh, was on its own to figure out what it wanted to do for advocacy. By joining our voices together and picking one to three action items per, uh, so, per legislative cycle, we can be thousands and thousands of voices for change in Columbus. So we are our own um, community organizing entity in Ohio. So we're RAC Ohio. Um, and we have, I'm on the leadership team for our own community organizing. So it's been very powerful. We have 17 um, statewide projects at this time. Um, and then the last thing is not a great thing. Um, this year in 2022, the Board of Trustees of HUCJIR has voted to sunset the um, Hebrew Union College campus in Cincinnati as an ordaining campus, and it will sunset that campus in 2026. It was um, a very uh, fraught process with um, hundreds and hundreds of, stu of graduates not want, it was just very fraught. I, I'll talk about it for the rest of the time we're together. So, um, and uh, so in 2026, Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati um, will no longer ordain. Um, it is unclear what will happen exactly with the campus, with the American Jewish Archives and with the Kalau Library. That was like a super fast, like here are the milestones because I really want to spend some time um, on some of the tenants. My guess is that for, I only picked a few things to talk about, God, revelation, authority, social justice, and humanity, that we are very similar, that the reform movement and the reconstructionist movement is very similar in many, many ways, and that we'll have to dig in um, to some things to find differences. Um, we are different movements, yet much of our outlook is similar and the way we approach things is, is about, is, is somewhat similar. Before I jump into tenants, because I zoomed through, you know, 200 years, um, any quick questions? Yeah, Louise, you are muted. So I have a couple comments. Um, mm -hmm. One is about patrilineal descent and interfaith families um, or interfaith marriage. And my um, uncle, my, my mother's brother, was a reform rabbi in Baltimore. And he did interfaith marriages in the 50s, 60s. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and he was one of the few uh, in the reform movement. So it isn't mm -hmm. like they decided on patrilineal descent and everybody. No, no, no. I'm sorry that I, yeah, I'll get back. Yeah. Let me, let me write that down. Cause I'll comment on that 
So tell me what else you wanted to say. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is about the first uh, uh, ordained rabbi. Um, uh, I, I wanted to say first American ordained rabbi because there was a woman in Germany. Germany. Mm -hmm. And then a couple hundred years before, there was a Sephardic woman who served as a rabbi. Mm -hmm. And um, I forget their names. but Yeah, there was a woman in Germany. Her first name was Regina. Right. I just forgot her last name. Yes, I'm sorry. I I, I thought I was implying since the whole conversation was about America. I imply I thought I was implying America. Yes, thank you for that. So I want to make sure that I was clear about um, patrilineal descent um, and interfaith marriage. So interfaith marriage was and for, for many still continues to be a, a difficult topic. The reform movement um, had a response, had a, had a, a, a you know, basically a, a conversation with reform rabbis that um, inter doing interfaith weddings was not what we, was not what the text allowed. And yet we don't, we are not governed by a body. We can make our own choices. So in the fifties and sixties, it's very rare for a reform rabbi to do interfaith weddings. The history of suburban temple call me is that uh, there has always been, um, the sitting rabbi has always done interfaith weddings, but you could count uh, on one hand in the 50s and 60s, the number of reform rabbis who would officiate at interfaith weddings. Um, and then, and maybe even 50s through 70s. In the 80s, it started to become more clear that um, people were going to marry out of the faith and that this was going to continue to happen. And more and more rabbis were struggling with what does this mean? And where do I stand? Um, the text was still clear. Um, HUC was still teaching, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Um, and so one of the responses was, if it's going to happen, if there is going to be interfaith marriage, um, even if you're not doing that wedding, you could embrace someone whose father is Jewish and they could be raised Jewish. So this was part of Alexander Schindler's response to interfaith marriage, um, was just one response. And part of that response in 1983 was because at, in 1983, very few reform rabbis were, were doing interfaith weddings. Um, I would say radically started to shift by 1990, 1995, but in 1983, um, still not, most rabbis were still not doing it. Um, and I was ordained in 1999, um, and I, I was ordained in Cincinnati, 1999. I was ordained with 20, 22, I counting myself. Uh, we were exactly 50-50 of who would officiate interfaith and who would not. So in, up to even 1999, you're, you're still really looking at quite a few rabbis not officiating. Um, by 2022, I would say most of the ordinees are officiating um, at interfaith weddings. So you can see the trajectory. So I'm sorry if I implied something that I didn't mean to imply. It was part of a response. I don't think you implied. Okay, great. Okay. So any other questions, comments, concerns? Okay, I, I'm very upset that I cannot remember Regina's last name. I even wrote a sermon about her. Okay, so um, very brief, um, very briefly, the beliefs tenants on uh, reform Judaism. Um, I believe, by the way, that I shouldn't use the word believe, it's, it's so redundant, that as 
in 2022, the vastness of what a reform Jew believes is impossible to put on a screen. Um, so trying to summarize this is almost unfair. Um, I do think that there's a, a general way and I, I, what I love about Reform Judaism is that we, we have a general direction that we like to try to teach, but we allow a lot of differences. So that's what I put here. We affirm the reality and oneness of God, even as we may differ in our understanding of divine presence of what that is. Um, so god god exists god is one god can have many 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 names and god can we can have we can teach a lot of different theologies questions or thoughts regina jonas who put that up there thank you thank you thank you thank you um questions or thoughts about that Okay. Revelation. So Torah is uh, an ongoing experience between the relationship be of the relationship between God and the Jewish people over history. So, you know, we, it, it's interesting. I'm writing a, a, my Devar Torah for this Friday on um, change happens in a moment, changes the external and transition is what happens over time. And that's revelation, right? So changes that moment that may or may not have happened at Sinai, um, that revelation, that revelatory moment. Um, but Torah is that transition, that constant transition that happens con all the time, that we're constantly learning and growing and experiencing and having Sinai moments. Um, and we, And that's what's beautiful about Torah for all of us. Um, authority, um, you know, we don't, we, we have the, um, Torah is not literal. We, it's the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law. And we have a lot to learn, but we do not have to take it. It's a guideline. That's why they can have the trafe banquet. <laughs> Sorry. Um, social justice is one of the most important things. And when we do social justice, when we create tikkun olam, well, that's how we're bringing Torah and God into the world. We do not believe in a Messiah. We believe in a messianic age. Um, and for humanity, each one of us is B'Tselem Elohim. Each one of us is in the image of God, whether we're Jewish or not. And therefore we have an obligation to create an inclusive community um, for everyone, for all kinds of families, no matter who or what they are. I'm guessing that felt pretty familiar. Yeah. Did anything feel different? Or was was it sort of like listening to Steve in a different voice? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I have, I have yeah. a question. I, yeah. you know, um, the, I appreciate all the those the pieces of you know philosophy and, and theology that you brought and i i'm just i'm curious about um like i've always felt there's here's the here's an example of something that i feel is similar between reform and reconstructionism but i know that in language we haven't necessarily gone in the same direction so i'm curious about the phrase chosen people in the reform context mm -hmm. and um you know in 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 the in the text that you just showed us under the humanity section it's obviously very clear that everyone's created in the image of god um and i i don't know it i mean i i grew up in part in the reform movement and i i think that that language was used at when you know when we were young i don't know if it's still 
something that people use if it's in the if it's in the liturgy just interested in your if you know the chosen the chosenness piece yeah yeah so i i have a lot of opinions on chosenness um i think the reform in my opinion the reform movement is still really struggling with how to balance the fact that not even a fact the feeling that we as reformed jews and our philosophy theology is that we are not the chosen people um and that everyone is special we are all batel elohim and yet much of the liturgy that we still use like the elenu has a lot of chosenness in it uh and so we're we're still in this interesting place where we we stay and we act in many ways i mean the religious action center we act and we walk a very particular walk and we're good at it and yet our words um are not all in line um you know the elenu is a particular pet peeve of mine for example um I, I have an ongoing dialogue with a number of members of the congregation because there are parts of the Elena that I don't lead because it says who makes us, you know, I don't even remember what it says anymore, but you know, who, who leads us and lifts us up above all the other people. And I, I'm, I'm not leading it. It's not what I do. It's not who we are and it's not how we behave. So, um, Shahuna Teshamayim Biosit writes that, that make that, that separates us from the rest of the earth. Mm-hmm. And so, do you, sorry. No, go ahead. I was just going to ask, do you think that's a widespread kind of position among contemporary reform rabbis? Do you think a lot of people would listen to you and, and say, yeah, and identify with, with that kind of, um, what, what my colleagues have said is they, they textualize their way. They text their way out of it because they like the melody. <laughs> So, and it's what we do with a lot of things that we love, right? So it, 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 there is a lot that we love in what we grew up with. Um, if, if you grew up with a song that you love, right? If you grew up with a, a, a poem that you love and, and suddenly you realize, oh, this is a little misogynistic, right? Or, um, oh, you know, I, I, theologically, this doesn't work for me anymore, but you love the melody or you can sing it and you can just be sitting next to, you know, your father of blessed memory, right? You just, you work a way around it because it has the feels. And I think that's what they do. Mm-hmm. And that's, it, it's, it's fine, it, right? It's, you know, it, everyone has it, to figure out. Everyone has to figure it out. Um, but I do, I do think there are a number of prayers and pieces in our liturgy and in our teaching that we're still not all there with. And I think the Reconstructionist movement has admirably worked through. Like Cole Nidre and the Reconstructionist movement. <laughs> yep. Okay. Yes. Do we? Right. But Kaplan wanted to get rid of it. Well, the reform movement tried to get rid of it, actually. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, in the first High Holy Day prayer book, Kondadre wasn't there. Um, And there was a mutiny. It was like, literally, there's this great story. There was literally a mutiny. And it was there the next year. (laughs) (laughs) Because it has all the feels. I mean, Kondadre is a vow. I mean, it's not even a prayer. But it has all the feels. Mm -hmm. So it's a great question. It's a great question. Other thought? Yeah. Joel, I think you're muted. I grew up uh, mostly Fairmount Temple. Um, and um, we had an Elenu that removed the, um, mm-hmm. the part that says, has not made us like other people. Good. Um, and 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 it's and, and in the uh, um, Sha'are Teshuva, which I happen to have handy, um, it also it just Aleinu Shabbat La Don Hakola Tet Kedulal Lutzer Bereshit, and then it skips to Shehu No Teshamayim. They have no problem with spreading out the heavens, but 
to skip the part about uh, has not made us like the families of the earth. Um, but the reform movement, as far as I know, never took out what the, um, from the Kiddush, what the, from the Friday Night Kiddush, what the, mm -hmm. uh, the constructions take out. Kivanu uh, Vacharta, because God, mm -hmm, correct. God, God shows us. And right. the reform movement never took out from the uh, prayer before you, you know, when you have an aliyah to the Torah, they never took out a share. Bahar Banu Mikol Right. So, and uh, those are two pieces that I still do, right? Right, right. Because, you know, and, yeah. and, and, tradition. And, and Kaplan rewrote, you know, he, I guess it's Kaplan himself, I don't know, or, or his mm -hmm. colleagues came up with alternative texts to have approximately the same meter and fit to the same tune mm -hmm. um, for those of us who are used to a certain comfort level, but, right. make, but change the words. Right. Right. And so for, for example, with the Kiddush and the Aliyah, um, for the Aliyah is a better example for me. The tradition at Suburban Temple Kolami when I came was that the Aliyah was read in English um, in a regular translation and Hebrew. I don't, we don't read it in translation anymore. So, um, so that I, I can sort of get around it a little bit for now. It's not really fair. I had a Hillel rabbi uh, who, who came from the conservative movement and was very, um, really quite orthodox in his thinking. Um, and uh, he would introduce some English prayers, English translations into the service. Um, and uh, the, some of the more orthodox students objected mm -hmm. uh, to the English. Um, but he said, you know, he said, um, I really think that for many of them, the objection to the English is that they don't believe their prayers to be true. Mm -hmm. And as long as they stay in Hebrew, it's it okay. doesn't feel so uncomfortable. So I, I, I have to <laughs> a follow up for that, which is exactly true. So we have um, a couple of, of newer families to so the congregation who are uh, who have come from the conservative world. And um, I was sitting and talking with them and they said, you know, we love, love being members, but the services are really hard for us. And they're really hard for us because there's so much English. Um, and they said, we don't like the English because now we have to really think about what we're praying <laughs> before I could just pretend. Um, and, and they said, one of them is actually having like a big theological like crisis because now they know what all the prayers mean. <laughs> so. Um, which is, you know, can bring us back to, into both what reform and reconstructionists have do, which is grapple with who and what we are as, uh, you know, American progressive Jews, and that we have to be in the meeting of the moment. Um, and it, in so many ways, the reconstructionist movement has been more bold and more courageous. Um, and the reform movement, um, and it might be partially because of sheer size, um, has not met that moment in all ways. Other thoughts or questions? Yeah, Alan. Yeah, so I was just thinking about the reform movement's emphasis and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's longstanding emphasis on social justice. And I was wondering, how does that get integrated into the service as opposed to, you know, a, an action that the congregation takes. So into the worship service, you mean to, yeah. into prayer? So it, it, it began um, with, um, with camp, actually. The best way, so historically, um, summer camp started the contemporary um, music, contemporary Jewish music movement. And so just as we have, you know, fabulous folk songs, which are songs, songs of protest, right? I mean, I don't know if you grew up, grew up in the folk song movement, but that was what, you know, all my family listened to, right? So, so too, then were there, um, 
young musicians who started writing Jewish songs that met, met that moment. So, um, Aniva Atanishanet Haolam, you, you know, I know, I don't know if you know that song, but you never ever want me to sing ever because then the Zoom will crash. So, um, so I don't know, Steve, do you know Aniva Ata? Um, yeah. yeah, we don't so, know. I don't, we don't sing it in services, but um, we have, we've had a music kind of a gathering of people to sing together that it's possible that that song okay got sung at some point but so uh, there there are many many songs that came of that sort of 1960s 70s generation where protest songs and folk songs were so important and that was where Debbie Friedman of Blessed Memory um, started the contemporary Jewish music reality. And that was where social justice started getting woven into what worship could be. Um, and that was where poetry started getting woven into worship and creative services. So, and that was all at camp and that was all in Nifty. So Nifty and camp changed the specter of worship and brought social action into Tikkun Olam into um, into worship, um, that you could sing um, in worship for change, and you could express your Judaism in that way. Um, my earliest memories are about singing and praying for change. Um, you know, I went uh, to the Soviet Jewry March in 1987, um, which was, I think, the largest action of its kind um, for the American Judaism, um, just Jews. Um, and, you know, we had a Havdalah, I think it was on a Sunday, right? Um, we had a Havdalah before we left. So bringing, bringing our spirituality into our, into our action was totally how I grew up. A hundred percent how I grew up. I'm, I'm not sure if that's answering your question. Yeah. It, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Heaven. I'm curious, um, at the camps, um, do they keep kosher? So um, each for a long time, no. <laughs> there was never any like pork or shellfish, but totally mixing of milk, meat and milk. Um, the camps have, um, summer camps have now centralized. And so, and then there was like, each camp could make its own choice. So in Texas, which is where I was from 1999 to 2011, we had a lot of meat and milk. I mean, it's Texas. So, um, but then in, in, you know, in New York and in, in Boston, they were not mixing meat and milk by the mid nineties. But now the camps are centralized under a central management and no camp, um, all the camps have separated meat and milk. There are, there's a salad bar at all the camps. It's actually really good. And there is dairy on the salad bar and they can choose to bring some meat, some dairy in. Um, but no, and there's, it's not kosher meat, um, but it is not meat and milk. And there's not separate dishes. For some, actually, Camp George may be kosher, but I don't think any of the other camps are. There are a whole lot of vegan and vegetarian kids, I gotta tell you. <laughs> a whole lot of them. <laughs> I have a camp follow-up question too. Um, a couple of weeks ago, when we had a conversation about conservative, about the conservative movement, it's everyone, there's universal agreement that summer camp is a powerful, positive experience for young mm -hmm. Jewish people. Mm -hmm. but it was interesting that in the conservative context, the positive, the positivity of the camp experience actually caused problems for the movement because when the kids came back mm -hmm. from camp, they didn't necessarily find, I mean, eventually I think they did, but I think it mm -hmm. took the movement a long time to figure out how to integrate the approaches that the kids were being exposed to at summer camp, you know, much, much earlier. Right. And, um, but it sounds like in the reform movement, that was not an issue at all. Um, it was an issue. I mean, for sure, because there wasn't an educational, um, like 
you know, catch up for the rabbis and board leading the congregations. Like, hey, your kids are going to come back from camp and they're going to want to sing mozi before every, you know, meal. And they're going to want to have song sessions and they're going to want to come to services in shorts and a t-shirt, right? Which, you know, in the early 80s was not happening. So um, that that was a, what what happened differently is the reform movement caught up faster. Um, and so that was a that helped the reform movement. Um, we also had Nifty. The conservative movement struggled with youth group work struggling now. I mean, you know, I don't want to like put one down and the other down. But at that time, our youth program was really, really strong. So the kids could filter into Nifty and have that voice and have that those staff members come and speak at congregations. Whereas for the conservative movement, because they had no resources to come back to and no resources to support the kids back in the congregations, it really made a tough disconnect. So the reform movement caught up faster um, in supporting that educational model and what they could be. It doesn't mean though that there wasn't, you know, one of the reasons that I believe there's an exodus um, from congregations is because the congregations don't look like camp. Um, you know, I, you know, if it doesn't look like camp, who wants to go? <laughs> so, um, but I do think the reform movement just caught up faster. Right. Louise and Joel. Yeah. Um, so, um, the, the conservative camps, the whole issue was egalitarianism and, mm. and girls roles that, and that's what they came back to. And, um, you know, they were right that was a big conflict yeah when the reform movement it, it's a little bit of a lighter conflict if the kids come back from camp and say can we have a guitar at services instead of that organ um that's not quite as fundamental as uh, how, right. how come i read torah at camp and you're never gonna let me read torah again right. until next summer and <laughs> it, it led to you know if you realize that the the splintering of the reform movement i mean there are i think there are five five seminaries now in the conservative movement. Sorry, it led to a splintering in the conservative movement. I think there are, I think there are five. I don't know three. Okay, don't know there's how two, many. There's two in Los Angeles. There's at least two in New York, at least. So maybe there's four. So if you, I have a question on a different subject. It goes yeah. back to intermarriage and patrilineal descent, especially yeah. intermarriage, where I think, um, uh, some of the embracing of intermarriage and patrilineal descent was because, hey, it's going to happen anyway, we might as well get on board. But some of it was, this is our opportunity to mm -hmm. expand the Jewish community. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and just, wow, you know, if we could get um, half of intermarried families to be active in synagogues instead of uh, what five percent this would make a huge difference to the future of the jewish community and i'm curious as to whether that's still the thinking and also whether those forecasts seem to be bearing themselves out of of um you know a whole generation of synagogue presidents and rabbis um coming from intermarried families who mm. would just so, not yeah um oh is there a generation it's a whole generation later now so the question is are, are the children of these intermarried families um um you know becoming active in congregations active in jewish life and this mm -hmm. and, and some appropriate percentage of them becoming jewish leaders and rabbis mm -hmm. and that sort of thing i'm just wondering if it's happening yeah later. so that's a whole lot of questions i'll try to remember all of them um and great questions so um Yes, and yes, and yes. So <clears throat> yes, it was, you know, we just have to kind of go with the tide. And also, is this an opportunity for Kiruv, right? Is this an opportunity to, to, you know, bring people in closer? Can we, can we really grab something beautiful here? And that was something Alexander Schindler was super, was really, really passionate about. 
And then later, Eric Yaffe was passionate about, he was the next president of the URJ. And in fact, one of the things he said was, is it so bad to invite someone to become Jewish? You know, is it so bad to say, hey, you could convert? This is not, you know, we don't always have to say no to someone who wanted to convert. If, if someone is showing an interest, do we have to always turn them away? Is, is this an opportunity? Um, so both Alexander Schindler and Eric Yaffe were in some ways visionaries with opportunities to really envelop their arms around trends that they saw happening um, in the larger community, in the Jewish community. Um, so yes, I think that you, you are right. Um, so where are, it's really, it's 40 years later, right? So what, what's going on? Um, I would have to go back and look at the last couple of Pew reports. Since I look at the Pew reports and look at the data and see what's happening. Um, so I, I don't want to report anything as fact that I don't have. What I can tell you is my experience in the last 23 years as a rabbi. Um, I really believe that accepting families of patrilineal descent, embracing um, people and inviting them to consider conversion, which I have done, um, rather than just sort of waiting for them to come to me. Um, and um, doing interfaith weddings, officiating at interfaith weddings has created uh, a pathway for a richer Jewish community. Um, I, one of the first bar and bat, one of the first bat mitzvah that I did in San Antonio, Texas in 2000 is now a rabbi. Um, she is a fabulous rabbi. Um, her mother, she's not patrilineal descent, but her mother was not Jewish. She did convert. Um, her father was on the outs with Judaism. They were invited to become more engaged with the congregation. And he is now a VP of the URJ and she is now a rabbi. Um, you know, had someone not done that wedding, we wouldn't have Rabbi Kelly Levy. Um, in this congregation, um, patrilineal descent, another one of my students is in her third year of rabbinic student, rabbinic school. Um, her mother is not Jewish, will never convert, goes to church sometimes, loves the congregation, raised both girls actively Jewish, um, and Hannah is in her third year of rabbinic school. Um, and just thank God, right? Um, and Hannah has lived in Israel for two years before she went to HUC. So, I mean, these are just two examples of people who are at HUC, let alone, you know, the kids that became camp counselors and the kids that were youth group presidents and the kids that, you know, just said something great to someone else about Judaism. Because we can't just go to the top of the cream of the crop, right? It's also who's saying great stuff about Judaism and who's representing the community beautifully. Um, so my experience is that we did a lot of really good work in making these decisions. Other questions? I would love to quickly do, um, it's a very quick tech study. It's actually sort of more of a game um, to wrap up our time. Okay. Is that okay? Totally. Yeah. Okay. So I have three texts. Um, and with each one, I want to see if you can guess kind of the era in which it was written, because each one is from one of the um, platforms from the Central Conference of American Rabbis. So is one, you know, an earlier platform like 1885, or is one more contemporary like 1999? Okay. Can we do that together? So I'm going to read it. Um, and I can't see you because I turned my other screen off. So I'm going to read it and then we're going to guess. We recognize in Judaism a progressive religion ever striving to be in accord with the postulates of reason. 
We are convinced of the utmost necessity of preserving the historical identity with our great past. Christianity and Islam being daughter religions of Judaism, we appreciate their providential mission to aid in the spreading of monotheistic and moral truth. We acknowledge that the spirit of broad humanity of our age is, also, is our ally in the fulfillment of our mission, and therefore, we extend the hand of fellowship to all who cooperate with us in the establishment of the reign of truth and righteousness among men. What are the three, is there are three options, time? So, okay, so I will tell you, I picked three texts and I picked, it's either, I'm gonna put it in here. So um, your options are 1885 or 1999 or 1937. Huh. When do you think this one's from? Oh, wait. It helps if I hit return. <laughs> Sorry. I'll go for the earliest. You think that one's 1885? Okay. It could possibly be 1937, too, because it ends with the men. And in 1937, they were probably still. Yeah, I'd go with 37. 19, okay, so who says 1885? Raise your hand. Okay, so we have two takers for 1885. Who says 1937? Okay, anybody say 1999? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, all right, it was 1885. Wow. This is the Pittsburgh platform of 1885. Wow. That's great. Yeah, I'll put it back up for a second. So what um, what's fascinating about this, so first of all, it's a little bit timeless, right? We recognize in Judaism a progressive religion, right? But if you think about 1885, the postulates of reason, right? We're still we're still in this timeline of where philosophy was teaching um really into reason, right? And we're still a little apologetic wanting to fit in with our neighbors, Christianity and Islam. If you think about it sociologically, it works really well. It's 1885. Great. Okay, next one. So now I made it really easy for you, right? Huh. It's gonna be process of elimination. All right. We strive for a faith that fortifies us through the vicissitudes of our lives, illness and healing, transgression and repentance, bereavement and consolation, despair and hope. We continue to have faith that in spite of the unspeakable evils committed against our people and the sufferings endured by others, the partnership of God and humanity will ultimately prevail. We trust in our traditions promise that although God created us as finite beings, the spirit within us is eternal. 1999 or 1937? Which one? All right. If you think it's 1937, raise your hand. If you think it's 1999, raise your hand. Anybody want to say why they think it's one or the other? I just thought that the unspeakable evils that they talked about, um, it, you know, it, it kind of indicated, um, you know, post Holocaust. Mm. So you're on board for 1999. Yeah. Okay, Joel, did you want to say? For the exact same reason as Alan. Okay. Anybody for 1937 want to give a reason? I just, I just thought the language was just kind of the 1999. 1999. Okay. Anybody for 1937? Want to share? Yeah, that's oh, you thought it was like more flowery, so it's 1937. Right. right. Yeah. So it is 1999. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. And it was very flowery language. Um, and the reason the reason you do know that is because it does sort of have an oblique reference to post-Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So obviously the last one. Okay. 
The Torah, both written and oral, enshrines Israel's ever-growing consciousness of God and of the moral law. It preserves the historical precedents, sanctions, and norms of Jewish life and seeks to mold it in the patterns of goodness and of holiness. Being products of historical processes, certain of its laws have lost their binding force with the passing of the conditions that called them forth. But as a depository of permanent spiritual ideals, the Torah remains the dynamic source of the life of Israel. Each age has the obligation to adapt the teachings of the Torah to its basic needs consonance with the genius of Judaism. That one's a mouthful. <laughs> the language is very heavy there. Did you get some of the ideas? And do they still feel timely? Yeah. I, I think that talking about holiness is difficult. <laughs> you do? Yeah. Yeah. And I still talk about the genius of Judaism all the time. The genius of Judaism? Yeah, yeah. that's different than home, talking about holiness. Yeah. It, it reminds me most of the three examples, I guess this isn't surprising, it reminds me most of Kaplan, of the three texts that you shared with us. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, 1937, 1937 yeah. 1937 was very close to the time that he published Judaism as a Civilization. Absolutely. And, so, so, well, it's not like the really long sentences. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, there's a particular writing style for each era, right? Hmm. Right. right. That's great. That's great. Well, yeah. This, this was a really interesting and thought-provoking and fun conversation thank this you and, i tend uh, to talk really fast so i i apologize if i uh, sorry no <laughs> so i really appreciate you uh putting up with my fast talking and um i hope i give you some things to talk about some things to think about and i appreciate the invitation well, it was great to have you. Alan, I'm sorry, I jumped in again. Like, this is... I, no, uh, go ahead. Finish now. You know, what's a <laughs> rabbi? It's very hard. <laughs> no, I, 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 I really, it is, uh, it is, it's, there's, there's no, there's no substitute to having a guest come in and speak about the tradition that they are a part of and that they represent. And it's, it's really a gift uh, to be able to learn with you. And mm -hmm. um, so... Thank you, and, and thanks to Alan again for doing all the legwork to invite people and, and organize, and uh, um, I hope you will continue to uh, feel um, reminded of your Texas home uh, in, in over the next few days as we uh, go through the- uh... I moved here so I wouldn't have to have 100 yeah. years together. Yeah, right. So I'm ready for it to be done already. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Right. Okay. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Good night. Good, night, man. Good night, everybody. Thanks for being here. See you next week. Yeah, Steve, do you want to um, just uh, make a brief phone call? I can't hear you. Sorry, I, I, I totally forgot that I had texted That's you. Okay. That's okay. That's uh, okay. How about we do a brief phone call? Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'll give you a call. Okay. All right. Talk to you soon. Okay. Bye.